Well, it is, uh, it's good to be finally at Covenant College. I, I tried to talk uh, f five of my teenagers into coming and I was unsuccessful, uh, so I came. Uh, uh, my, my one daughter went to Cedarville, which is a fairly conservative uh, college in Ohio, and um, I, I, you know, just the dress code was a little different there than here. So anyway, I was just noticing that. Um, uh, the, uh, just a quick story on Francis Schaeffer, and uh, my father uh, taught at Westminster Seminary, and uh, in the summer of 68, he visited Labrie for the first time, and he encountered something there he had never seen before. And it was a community that had the prayer meeting at the center of it, uh, which meant prayer was at the center of the community. And uh, he came home in um, 1968, I remember I was just 15 at the time, and he was just like, he was surprised at that. He had never seen that before. He wondered what, uh, what that meant, and over the next couple of years, he read a book by a Princeton scholar uh, called Pauline Eschatology by Gerhardus Voss that showed that the spirit really resides at the center of, uh, of every Christian community, and prayer is the conduit to the spirit of Jesus. And out of that came uh, kind of a, a little explosion of PCA churches in the Philadelphia area, the New Life churches. Um, Tim Keller visited what, what was part of our church for a while, and it helped shape his preaching to become even more, more gospel-centered, the Sonship Course and Surge, and just a number of ministries came out of that, all from that thread of, of that, uh, just that one little thread. So it's just really neat to see how the Spirit works. Uh, what, what I want to talk with you uh, over the next two days is a very simple idea, and I want to read one of the places that Paul uh, 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 mentions it, and it's from uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 11, and let me read here in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a, a, a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That is the great Reformation truth of justification by faith that I'm sure you are very familiar with. And it, it really sits at the heart of our faith. But when you read over the, the next two verses, you immediately encounter a puzzle. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. There, you know, when you look at that passage, I, I have a couple notes you might be able to see down there. You know, when you look at verses 10, 11, uh, they just seem odd. They seem mystical. Uh, like, why does Paul want this? I mean, all of us work to avoid suffering, and Paul says, I want a, I, this is a passion. As much as I want to know I'm justified by faith, I want to be in union with Christ in his dying and rising. It's just like, what the heck is Paul talking about? Now, Paul's narrative here follows the narrative of Jesus' death and resurrection. And he's actually, so it's shaped like, I'll, I'll draw it right on the, this thing here. It's shaped like the letter J. So Paul wants to go down into Jesus' death and then up into resurrection. And this is actually a tight summary here of the previous chapter, and I'm just going to go to that. Um, right here is the J in Philippians chapter 2. And let me go through this, uh, uh, just read it down. I, I, I have the text written out in the letter J because that's kind of what Paul's doing. Though he was in the form of God, did not count 
uh, 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 talking about Jesus, did, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what I'd like to do is explain what that means in a simple story. Uh, stories are to theology what experiments are to science. If, if, if it doesn't work in an experiment, then there's something wrong with the theory. And, and this little story happened a few years ago. We, are, we, we um, have six children, and our fourth child, Kimberly, has pretty significant disabilities. She has a, a chromosomal uh, disorder called 1P36 that gives her autism. She's, de she's delayed. Uh, she, she's pretty much functionally mute, but she has a speech computer, and <clears throat> she has all the struggles of, of people who, who struggle with autism, like waiting and lines or anything new can put her into a grand mall, whatever. Anyway, I was speaking down in Florida, uh, doing a prayer life seminar, and they were videotaping me, and I thought, you know what, I'll take Kim with me. And, uh, and just to give my wife a break for the weekend. So uh, we packed up our bags, went down to the Philadelphia airport, and as soon as we got out at long-term parking, uh, Kim uh, opened her, her book bag and started whining. And she has a really sophisticated whine. We had thought of selling it to the KGB, and they could skip water torture. You know, it was just you know, you would be, have your prisoner putty in your hands. And she, anyway, and she was whining because the book that she had asked her mom to pack wasn't packed. So we got over to the, the bus stall, and there were about 15 people around, and I had my bags, Kim's bags, in this big box that my, my organization is called See Jesus, and someone had written on it really large letters, See Jesus. And Kim had to wait again. And I hadn't prepared her. And I was like, I looked like a religious nut. You know, Kim's whining. I got this. And I even debated whether I could somehow hide the letter see Jesus. Um, and I, I gave up. And then the bus came. And then I panicked. Okay, how do I get Kim on the bus and all the luggage? So I decided to get Kim on the bus, come back with the luggage. And at that point, when I was coming back on the bus, the doors closed on me which delighted Kim because she likes it when people get in trouble. So she's giggling. I'm yelling at the bus driver. Anyway, we, we get to the terminal, and we, 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 are, we have gotten kind of late now, and so, we can't ch so I've, I've got to take our bags to the plane. And uh, we, we get in the security line, and just as we got there, they, they closed two lines and, um, and combined them, and, and so Kim had to wait longer, except when she waits, because, she, you know, her, her sense of space, she waits like right like this next to people, and they kind of jump and, excuse me, excuse me, so I kind of use her autism to get ahead in line. Um, and then we got to security, and she has a speech computer, and she starts arguing with the, the security official that she says, it's my voice, you can't take away my voice. I just yanked it out of her hand and put it on the conveyor belt, you know, and we barely made it to the plane on time, and um, we, we got on the plane, I got Kim fully electronic in the back, she had her earphones on, she, you know, she had her speech computer, and the stewardess came by and told her to turn off her voice, and she started arguing with the speech computer that it's my, you know, you, you know it's my voice, you can't, anyway, Kim, will you just, I just reached over and turned it off, and then, we were doing fine until the plane, and it was dark outside, the, 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 uh, the pilot came over the intercom saying we were 12th in line for takeoff. And just knowing that we were in a line freaked her out, you know. She couldn't see any of the other planes. And I was just, she had a, we were in the back of the plane and she had a grand mole meltdown. And I, I was just like, I, I, can't, I had promised to take her to Disney for one day, and it was like, Kim, I won't take you, I was going to, the words were out of my mouth, you know, 
uh, I, I won't take you to Disney, but that was part of the trip. And I was just, ugh. And I, I, I said, I, to myself, I will never do this again. This was a mistake. And then, uh, over the next day or two, as I thought about it, I remembered this idea of the J-curve, that the normal Christian life is dying and rising with Jesus. And what I, and it, it, it let me see it through a whole new lens. And that's what this J-curve does, is realizing that what Paul calls in that other passage we were looking at, he, he calls it a sharing in his sufferings. The, the word there is, is, is koinonia. The NIV calls it a fellowship of his sufferings. That, that the way Jesus' death works, the way, uh, here, let me just go to this one here. So, oops, I hit the wrong one. Um, the, I'll just stay here. So the way Jesus' death works is that my, uh, in, in this case, I am going through a mini dying. So my wife, Jill, can have a mini resurrection. We'll just abbreviate that. That's, in, in other words, the, the, the structure of the gospel is the structure of the Christian life. It's how life works. So my death gives Jill, my wife, at home freedom. And what, what happens is we get confused when we begin to do something uh, and we think everything has gone wrong, but that's exactly the, the, the very structure of love. Let me show it to you here in another way. If you actually look at Jesus' incarnation, uh, his, um, oops, his death, whoops, sorry people, um, here we go. If, if you look at his death, his death goes down in two stages. The first stage going down right to here is uh, the incarnation. And I call that love. The next part is suffering. So love always leads to some kind of suffering. It's the very structure of love. In other words, that's how the normal Christian life works. That to enter, so what my expectation, God's desire for me, what Paul is describing, is that my life is a continually reenacting of the dying of Jesus. So, and look what that did for me. Think of what I was like um, uh, in, you know, my concern how I looked uh, when I was at the bus stall. Uh, and I remember the feeling the same way in the back of the plane. Uh, and what God was doing, he was humbling me for the day for Saturday when I would be in front of a crowd of people and being videotaped and people would be hanging on my word. God gave me a dying to prepare to give me the gift of humility the next day. In other words, the gift of weakness is something that I repeatedly need to be reminded of to inhabit. I continually need to inhabit the weakness of dying in order to kill that the, the, the pride that continually creeps up. So what that does is it transforms how we view anywhere from mild irritations to really big suffering in our life. So the dying on the left side, the dying here of humiliation, gives me the gift of humility on the right side. And so it is a, it's just a completely different way to look at the Christian life. Now, you don't really understand this J-curve, though, until you understand the opposite of the J-curve. And the opposite of the J-curve is the failure boasting chart. And let me explain that uh, very briefly um, here in this one here. I'm going to go to number uh, 32. 
Uh, I can explain the failure boasting chart very easily with a, a story. Uh, let me do it from Paul's writing here first, though. Um, right before those verses I read from Philippians 3, Paul gives us a verbal failure boasting chart where he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I had the highest SAT scores. My GPA was the highest. And not only that, I, had a, I was as to the law of Pharisee, as to a zeal persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law blameless. The failure boasting chart is essentially looking at all of life through the desire to move up. And uh, let, let me, here's a quick example of that, and, and then I'll have a, just a slightly longer story. My granddaughter, Claire, who's, uh, going, who's a senior this year, uh, uh, was uh, doing a science two-week, um, uh, helping out a science camp for, for two weeks. And I said to Claire this summer, sort of jokingly, I said, Claire, are you building your resume or are you loving these kids? And she knew what I was thinking about. She said, I'm building my resume, Grandpa. You know, and she was laughing when, when, when she said it. And then I, I texted her this morning if I could use that quick story. And she said, oh, yeah. In fact, when I actually did my college application, there was no space left. And I couldn't even mention my two weeks at the science camp. So anyway. But, but let me give you a, um, a, a story to show how profoundly helpful the J-curve is. And it, it, uh, I just have to find it here. Uh, just take me a second. Uh, my daughter, uh, Emily, uh, who I mentioned in Praying Life, that's her sitting on the bench um, in playing field hockey. And when she was in 11th grade, the coach was playing favorites. And Emily and her friend were sidelined to the bench uh, a lot. And it was a lot of fun going to those games. I, I, my sisters played, my other daughters had played, and I, I knew the game. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't happy with it, uh, but you know, there wasn't a lot I could do. I, I, I went to Emily and said, Emily, do you want me to talk to the coach about it? And she said, no, Dad, I'll take care of it. So I was thankful for that. And a parent who also had her dog, her, her um, kids on the team, came up to me at the gym and said, isn't it terrible what the coach is doing with Emily and her friend? And I said, you know, I'm not happy about it, but uh, life is a lot more like bench sitting uh, than starring on a field, and I, I, I'm thankful that Emily can have this low-level suffering on my watch with her. And she looked at me like she had met a Martian. Um, it was like we, we were both Christians, both sent our kids to the Christian school, but we inhabited different narratives. And that's what we're describing here. It's two ways of looking at um, and here is her, this mom's narrative is here. She's actually looking at Emily uh, going down the failure boasting chart where sports is life or my kids and their success are life. And I was, uh, just because God had taken me so much through it and I had spent so much time meditating on this, this had really, the spirit had really brought this home to my heart as the, as the master narrative that I wanted. So I was looking at Emily through the J-curve. So I saw Emily as having an experience of being drawn into the life of Christ. And it, it just, it, they are two entirely different ways of doing something. We were doing exactly the same thing on the outside but it transformed our entire lens. And this is a very forgotten lens in Christianity. This J-curve dominates the book of Philippians. It is the central theme of the book of First and Second Corinthians. Uh, Paul lives it in the book of Philemon. Uh, and all through the, 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 the book of Acts, you see it. You see 
Paul in um, uh, Romans 6 refers to it. In Romans 8, he refers to it. In Colossians 3, it dominates those chapters. It's the master narrative of Paul is the narrative of Jesus dying and rising. It's his template for life. And this template over here, this one here on this side here, the failure boasting chart, is it's just, it's exhausting to live on that. Um, it, 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 it gives you stress, uh, anxiety, it's depressing. And if, if this is your model here, the J-curve, it gives you freedom, it, it gives you hope. Um, you're, you're not, you know, one of the things when suffering hits you, and almost everyone in this room is dealing with some kind of low-level suffering. When suffering hits you, it begins to just kind of gnaw at you, and it can just be, you know, you can begin to kind of get sucked into a kind of a low-level depression. And what this does is it shows you where you are. It gives you a map for your life. Okay, I'm in this suffering, I'm in a death, and I wonder what the resurrection will be. And again, you know, we can't, we don't control the timing of the resurrection um, or the character of the resurrection. But God is in the resurrection business. We are so used to thinking of uh, the resur Jesus' resurrection in the past and our future resurrection, one of the dominant, this idea of the J-curve and what Paul talks about is for Paul, it's an ongoing, everyday experience to taste the resurrection of Christ. And there, just that little story, the, the first story of Kim there, you know, the, the, the resurrection that came out of that was in humility for me and hope for Jill and a, a, a videotape. And I, I actually started ki taking Kim with me. Here's one of the little mini resurrections that came out of that story. After that, she and I would go around and tell that story uh, and I would, she can't talk straight, but I can ask her questions. So we were at a banquet down in uh, Washington, D.C., and I told her I would pay her 50 bucks for the day. She doesn't really know the value of money, but she, knew, she knows you can get DVDs with it, whatever, and books. She loves that. So, we, so, so what we would do is we would tell the story of this, this awful trip to Florida, which she now thinks is really funny. And... Um, and she, she'll smack her head as we're going through the story, giggling. And um, so we were about 250 people at this uh, banquet. This uh, uh, it was a Young Life fundraising banquet. And so we told the story, and we had already practiced. And after 10 minutes, Kim was going to sit down, and then I was going to give a brief talk. Except when, the, when we finished telling the story, she wouldn't get down from the stage, and she went over to her speech computer, which was hooked up to the mic, and typed out M-O-N-E-Y. <laughs> Show me the money, Dad. <laughs> you know, and by the way, our home is filled with little things like that. Just a lot of joy. You know, I mean, we are right in the beginning of Kim's, what we call the high holy days in our family, because Halloween's coming up. We've already bought our Halloween costumes. Um, uh, uh, Cogsworth and Lumaire, my wife and I are going out as. <laughs> Kim's going to be Belle. You know, and Kim is 38 now, and it was a 20-year downward thing for my wife, with um, particularly my wife. Uh, it, it just, as a mom, it just gets you in the gut. And... Um, Actually, much of what God taught me was in drawing me, uh, caring for Kim was easy, but learning to care for my wife, when we had five other kids in addition to Kim, learning to care for her, I, I, by, by the time Kim was 10, I did not know how to help her anymore. I, I just, I, I, I didn't know how to love her, and, and it forced me into a study of Jesus, and everything that I teach on and learn came because of the gift of Kim. And so those dimes that you, uh, I mean, maybe your dime is you've not been asked out on a date. 
uh, for forever or for 20 years. That's that the one thing you can do with dying is you can receive it as a gift from the Father. That's at the very heart. That's the very first. That's how you get drawn into a fellowship of his sufferings. Is you, Father, I take this life that you have given me. I take this problem and I take it. it you, you are down with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, taking the cup with him. That's why it's a fellowship of his sufferings. His sufferings are over, yet even his redemptive sufferings are over, but he now joins you as the dying, rising Savior in your sufferings. And it, it, it transforms your death and gives you hope, because hope is the last word. And out of this, out of this J-curve, God forms in you, in us as a community, the beauty of Jesus. And that's the end game. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that you would imprint your church with the beauty of Jesus um, as we participate in reenacting the dying and rising of Christ. I, Father, I pray that we would not just believe the gospel, but we would become like the gospel uh, as we look at our hearts, as we look at, around, at, at, at those around us as we inhabit life. Uh, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on Covenant College, pour out your spirit on the student body here. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.